welcome to our first NCD Academy panel discussion on COVID-19 in Latin America. As the coronavirus pandemic continues to disrupt daily life across the globe, the American College of Cardiology and our partners, the NCD Alliance and World Heart Federation, are bringing together experts from across the healthcare sector to discuss the latest recommendations to keep your patients safe. Today, we will be discussing how clinicians and policy experts are rethinking healthcare delivery to curtail the virus and treat COVID-19 patients in a way that's sustainable and allows us to remain attentive to other critical priorities for the well-being of our communities. I'll be your moderator. My name is Ibrahim Pindo. I am a cardiologist in Sao Paulo, Brazil, past president of the Society of Cardiology of the State of Sao Paulo, and a member of the Science and Quality Committee of the ACC. To get us started, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Dr. José Sosa from Peru and Dr. Ludmila Har, who now introduce themselves. Hi, my name is José Manuel Sosa. I am clinical cardiologist from Lima, Peru, and also former president of the Peruvian Society of Cardiology. Uh, Ibrahim. Ibrahim is my colleague uh, from many years in Brazil. I'm cardiologist in Brazil. I'm professor of cardiology of the Department of Cardiopneumology at the University of Sao Paulo. And now I'm the coordinator of Heart COVID-19 ICU at the University of Sao Paulo. During these pandemics, we are now a reference center of COVID-19 for the health public system in Brazil, now located in Sao Paulo at the University of Sao Paulo. We have now a dedicated build with 900 beds only for COVID-19 patients. So for me, it's really a pleasure to be here talking to you and to the other friends about all the challenges this pandemic brought to our lives and to our patients' lives. Thank you very much. Before we get to today's main topic, I thought we might just spend a few minutes sharing research on the way on COVID-19 that may be not relevant to the theme of this panel today, but nonetheless, it has important implications for patients that primary care providers and other clinicians should be aware of. So I would ask our panel, what are the latest findings for any study underway in your country or in your region to better understand the impact of COVID-19 and the viability of potential therapies? Unfortunately, at the moment, there aren't many published articles from my country. There are an university who is currently working towards a vaccine and are testing in, in animal models. From the articles that are currently available, most of them are epidemiology studies that show the big impact of COVID-19 related to the mortality and the economic impact that this virus is causing. For example, Peru is facing a tremendous burden from the COVID-19 pandemic, as it is, is among the top 15 countries in the world on regard to be reported COVID-19 case, and is the second in Latin America only after Brazil. So in Brazil, uh, we have many groups of researchers uh, working on uh, basic science and also in uh, clinic science about uh, potential therapies for COVID-19. Um, last month, uh, we had the first results of a very interesting group of research in Brazil, named Coalition, with many research of uh, about uh, 55 hospitals, uh, which were included in this uh, randomized clinical trial. So in this trial, patients with COVID-19 uh, with a moderate disease were randomized to receive or not hydroxychloroquine as a potential therapy. And this study with about 500 uh, included patients, uh, the, uh, the question was whether a therapy with hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin would decrease the rate of complications in 15 days of disease. They randomized patients in three, three groups. Uh, one group hydroxychloroquine without azithromycin, the other group hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin, and the other group without both drugs. And what the researchers uh, found 
was that in 15 days of follow-up, there was no difference uh, among groups regarding the clinical findings of disease. So this was the first randomized study published in the world with COVID-19 looking to this question, uh, whether there would be a value of adding hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin with a placebo group. So um, I consider that this is an important finding because when we look to Brazil and also to US and other countries, many physicians now have the doubt uh, if they should or not include hydroxychloroquine to these patients. And this was um, a very well randomized study with placebo group, and it was powered to find definitely that in this population, these drugs does not work to prevent complications. I would also highlight the finding of the researchers from the University of Sao Paulo, uh, who in uh, April, April, they showed in the first autopsy uh, findings in these patients that in the lung of these patients, we found um, alveolar, alveolar damage with inflammation, but also we found thrombosis. So in April, uh, these researchers, uh, uh, Paulo Saldiva, he is a full professor of pathology at the University of Sao Paulo. He was on a, one of the first researchers in the world to show that in the pathology of this uh, lung, we had uh, much thrombosis. After this study, we had many finds. We had the findings worldwide of venulite, of endothelial dysfunction, of inflammation and thrombosis. And now, now we can drive a therapy for these patients based on biomarkers such as the dimer and interleukin-6 and ferritin and CRP and others, showing that we have an imbalance between inflammation and thrombosis. So this was, uh, these were important findings from this group of the University of Sao Paulo. I would like also to highlight a paper uh, which is just coming out in the clinical infectious disease. It was the MET COVID um, randomized clinical trial. It was a trial published by the group of Manaus of Amazonas. Amazonas mm -hmm. is one of the main centers that we had the first cases of disease. It's in the north of Brazil. Now, fortunately, the number of cases are decreasing. And this study is named Match COVID Studies, a randomized clinical trial which addressed the role of methylprednisolone, trying to decrease mortality in these patients, patients in the ICU with lung damage uh, uh, by COVID-19. And what the researchers found is that in all the sample, it was about 350 patients included, there was no difference between groups, but in the subgroup of patients aging higher than 60 or with CRP higher than 5 milligrams per deciliter, the steroids did improve mortality. So we had not only this paper, but the paper from Oxford with dexamethasone, which showed in all the patients needing oxygen during the regular ward or the intensive care unit that dexamethasone could improve uh, survival rates more in patients needing invasive mechanical ventilation, but also in the subgroup of patients needing oxygen, uh, even that it was one liter per minute of oxygen. So I think that these important uh, uh, randomized clinical trials published in Brazil showed uh, a new frontier that we should not use hydroxychloroquine, neither azithromycin in the moderate forms of disease, that we are talking about an inflammatory and thrombotic disease, and also that the steroids do have a role in these patients, maybe in the more inflammatory phenotype such we are seeing in these last months. I would also tell that a group of researchers on the public um, uh, health of the University of Sao Paulo, 
They published the first data of three months of follow-up in Brazil, showing that we have important data of different rates of mortality when we look to the black people and people living in regions such as North and Northeast. So we are talking about a very heterogeneous disease, but now we are showing our inequality, our uh, racism. There are many points that could be improved if we have a more equal country with the same chances. Now we should face with this challenge, trying to improve our performance in Brazil as a whole country, not a very heterogeneous country when we look in separate regions and races and color. Now, looking beyond Latin America, what would you consider to be the most significant recent findings globally in the fight against COVID-19? The most significant will be the, the, the development of the vaccine that can already be tested on human volunteers. And the use of antiviral such as remdesivir, also the, the most recent findings related to the virus behavior are very valuable for the continuation of preventive measures, virus viability on aerosols, etc. Mm -hmm. And are you optimistic about that? Uh, I know the, the problem is the uh, have a, a, a good vaccine. The vaccine is, is the is the key. Um, I would like to highlight the Redensivir paper from US. It was a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine by the researchers of uh, University of Nebraska. They showed that Redensivir in patients included in all over the world, in Asia, America, uh, European countries, Redensivir could decrease the duration of disease in four days. And this is an important finding for us. Also, the steroids that we are trying to include in our prescription, and now uh, people are studying a little bit more about tocilizumab, and recently we had a release of the first randomized clinical trial with a placebo group uh, that was released by Hosh Industry. And this paper was a negative paper. They uh, had a randomized clinical trial. We don't know details because it's not uh, published yet, but they released the first findings that there was no difference between groups regarding mortality, neither septic shock uh, occurrence or other complications. Tocilizumab is an anti-interleukin-6 uh, monoclonal antibody that uh, a few countries or a few institutions are adopting as a possible therapy in the phenotypes of more inflammatory disease, but we don't have definite data to confirm that it's a good or a potential therapy. Brazil is also studying this drug in the coalition group, but we don't have yet the data. And also, we are looking for the convalescent plasma. Uh, it's a um, very interesting therapy. We have a rational for this, and the only randomized clinical trial that we have published until now was published one month ago in JAMA. It was a paper from China, and with the paper, with 103 patients included to receive or not the convalescent plasma, when we look to the general population of critically uh, ill patients or severely ill patients, there was no difference between groups. But when we look to the critically ill patients, not so critical, they had a benefit. But it, it's a subgroup analysis that we need to confirm. Here in Brazil, we have uh, many centers studying these uh, patients, so we don't have yet definite data regarding uh, the convalescent plasma. At the University of Sao Paulo, we studied only 10 cases, but we had a very interesting finding that we are uh, working to analyze it as fast as possible, but we uh, included 10 critically ill patients using invasive mechanical ventilation, and we performed 
uh, angiotomography looking for pulmonary embolism in these patients. We found uh, positive angiotomography only in three of the 10 cases. In the other seven cases, we performed angiography with OCT. We performed OCT into the pulmonary vessels. And the findings are very interesting. From those seven cases, with angiotomography, normal angiotomography, we found in six of them thrombos in distal vessels that we could see using the OCT. Wow. So a very important mechanistic finding, Alexandre Abizaide, Fabio Sandoli, Carlos Campos, and others helped me in this study. I am the first author of this study. We are trying to analyze those findings, but they, I think that it's very interesting because we show that even with the tomography normal, the OCT can reveal the presence of microthrombotic disease. And so maybe it will help me to find a better way to treat these patients. So it I might be a game changer. It might be yeah. a game changer. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We are working with this data because, Ibrahim, we had to ask for a software because we, we could not take the photograph of the yeah. soil of the OCT. So this software came today, and so we are working in these images, and we hope that in two or three days we have this ready and we'll submit uh, to be published. Let's pray. Let's cross our... Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be. It might be a game, a game changer. So thanks for this valuable insights. Now let's address our main topic, flattening the curve, raising the line. No two countries in the world are sharing the same experience with COVID-19. Some have faced more severe outbreaks than others. We've seen different strategies to manage these outbreaks with varying degrees of success. And what works best is heavily dependent on context. So I'm curious to know what COVID-19 has been like for each of you locally and what wisdom you might share with after several months of dealing with this unprecedented crisis. My first question would be, what trends have you noticed in COVID-19 infection rates in your country over the past several weeks? And what factors have risen these trends based on the data and your observations? So is it going down? Is it staying the same? Is it going uh, rising up again? What are your uh, uh, opinions and views on that? Sadly, in our country, the trend is for new infection to continue to rise up. The infection rate does not seem be, uh, to be slowing down. Um, it seems it won't be happening in the near future. This is mainly due to the fact that our country is lacking optimal medical assistance in resource that can be easily accessible to everyone. There is a huge disparity in our population as a consequence of economic inequalities. Also a consideration a considerable number of the population is not complying with the preventive measure. And finally, it is important to mention that a great number of health workers have become infected because they don't dispose of the all protective measures they, they need. Uh, those working in the public system that are above 65 years old or, or has chronic disease are not allowed to work because of being considered a risk group. So this increased the demand of a viable health care. Well, in Brazil, uh, what we can observe now is that different from other countries, such as US and European countries, that were countries where we could observe two or three months of increased numbers. And also we started to see decreasing numbers of new cases and of mortality in Brazil. We are not seeing this. In Brazil, the disease started in March. The first case was February 26. So in March, we had less than 500 cases. Mm -hmm. In April, the number of cases increased. In May, increased also. In June, increased also. And now in July, maybe we are leaving the peak of the numbers with uh, almost uh, 100,000 cases of mortality almost 3 million of cases. So we are seeing increasing the curve, not flattening the curve. Maybe uh, we have many factors around this, uh, 
um, we had uh, a bad strategy to take care of the crisis. We did not have a government which was able to centralize the decisions to understand our heterogeneity because we have a very huge population with more than 200 million people distributed in a health public system, which is perfect. However, we have heterogeneous uh, distribution of quality of care among uh, regions uh, such as North and Northeast. We had the highest rates of mortality because mm -hmm. the quality of care, uh, they, are, they are not prepared to uh, take care of these patients. We had less physicians, less nurses, less quality of care. And at the same time, we did not have a plan to lead with this crisis. So each state uh, are leading, is leading, uh, such as they can lead. So we don't have a leadership, we don't have a plan. So we are living bad days. What we can see is that the first regions, such as Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Amazonas, we are now seeing the flattening the curve. But on the other hand, we have nine states now uh, which are increasing uh, the number of infected people, the number of deaths. So in the general, we are not leaving yet the flattening of the curve. We did not have a very good adhesion to the first measures of uh, isolation, of distances, because we did not have a real combat plan of, this, of the disease. I think that we can do better. We still can improve. States such as Sao Paulo, leaderships um, found at the universities, at the reference centers, they can help the country. But we really need the government and the other authorities really uh, emphasizing the role of the country fighting against the disease not as regions, not as separate uh, group of actions. Uh, it's funny, in Sao Paulo, like you said, we were taken up slow, but then we, we came to the peak late, but there was a peak last, that's July, yes. and now we see this flat. So it behaves very differently. It's amazing. Now, Dr. Susan may have information on Peru, but the behavior of the disease in Brazil was different from anything we expected, right? Another important par point for us in Latin America particularly is how do you think that clinicians and health officials could improve public compliance with social distancing recommendations to reduce the spread of COVID-19? Latins are more like a warm people and they like to embrace, to be together. So that's a bit of a challenge in here in South, in South America, Latin America. How do you think that clinicians and health officials could improve public compliance, could people more aware of what's going on and what they should do? Here comes to the education and awareness we provide to our patients and the population in general. The most effective ways for communication with the people are through the media, television, internet, radio, and especially social social media. Mm -hmm. And people in Latin America are very much into social media, right? So yeah, we're very very powerful ally if we know how to use it properly. Important point now is to convince people they must believe. They must believe that our individual uh, work will be very important uh, to, to win this. Uh, we did not have this education as a role in Brazil. We had lots of unplanned actions, and each time we had new information, some people did not follow what the World Health Organization uh, told us to do. So what I think is that we should uh, create a narrative, a only one narrative of everybody fighting against this disease because the challenges are too much. We have lots of people in Brazil dying from cardiovascular disease, of cancer, needing surgeries. 
without a planning, we should look for cardiovascular health, for chronic diseases, for rehabilitation, and all the people must understand what we are living, which are the risks and the potential new waves that we can have or we should face against in the next months. So I think the main way is to promote education. People must believe in their leaders in an integrative way. We should have a centralized action of education, of looking for the population as a role and not in heterogeneous plans of actions, which now are located in the states, in the cities, but we look, we should look for all the country, for all the people, because all of us are in the same way fighting against a disease which uh, is not only causing deaths now, but will be the responsible for cardiovascular deaths, cancer, and the chronic impact of this healthcare. Yeah, education and science are, uh, are the, the weapons we have to win this war. Another thing, another point that's very important, and uh, we need, we should perhaps discuss it a little bit further, is that screening and contact tracing are widely considered the gold standard for avoiding virus outbreaks. How can health systems successfully expand these services in both urban and rural communities in ways that recognize differences in resource availability and the population density? What do you think of that? The only way to make uh, sure healthcare can be implemented in both urban as well as rural areas into government investment. In our country, there are isolated areas and communication hub had no roads or communication to bigger towns to allow any sort of transportation of health workers and medicine. There is a, a deficit in health workers that could really relate to all these different towns where they could have access to a proper medical facilities with mm -hmm. all the necessary resources. There is also a deficit in the number of people to work in contact tracing. And this is an important role from the epidemiology standpoint. But without government investment, little can be done. I think this is a very important point. If we have strategies of screening, of mass tests, we should really isolate. Who should be isolated? We should create an education in these people. But Brazil did not work for this we tested less than 5% of our population. And so when we ask for 200 million people to be isolated, it's impossible. But if we had applied mass tests and education in those who really needed to be isolated, maybe we could have um, written a different history. Uh, we still have time, we can uh, work with um, technology transfer, as we are working with the vaccines, with the next uh, issue that we have against the virus. However, it was not a priority of the Brazilian government. And I think this was one of the main points that we missed as a strategy to have improved our quality of care of these people. Sounds about right. But another important point, particularly when we're discussing also flattening the curve, is hospital capacity to admit patients. So I would like to know from each of you if it has been a challenge for hospitals in your area to accommodate all COVID-19 patients who need to be admitted for care. What protocols have been put in place to try COVID-19 patients for inpatient treatment? Yes. It has been challenging. Hospital has collapsed and streaming measures have been taken by improvising hospitalization areas and to provide enough bed for everyone. Oxygen arrival has been agreed or deal and numerous families have seen themselves forced to buy their own oxygen tanks to provide for their loved ones uh, as hospital have run out of them. In regards to the protocol followed in each city, there are hospital exclusive 
the same to COVID-19 patient. All patients undergo a serology test, oximetry, and pulmonary tract in private medical centers, but only thorax x-ray and, and public hospitals. Management is predominantly, predominantly focused on the provision of supportive care, oxygen therapy, corticoids, corticosteroids, and empiric treatment, empiric treatment with drugs such as hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, and ivermectin. Antiviral therapy has been for specific recommended for the, the case more complicated. Despite the strategic implementation of this measure, the number of new report cases continue to rise at a profoundly alarming rate. As new findings emerge, there is an urgent need for up-to-date management guidelines. Uh, perfect. In Brazil, uh, we have about, when we look to the health public system and the insurance, we have about 60,000 ICU beds. During the pandemics, uh, our government increased them to 21,000 beds of ICU. So we have huge numbers of ICU beds, but our main challenge is the quality of care. In a recent published study by the, the uh, intensive Care Society, the Brazil Intensive Care Society, we showed that in three months of disease in Brazil, the mortality rates in the health insurance hospitals in ICU were about 20%. Mortality rates in the health public systems ICU were 40%. So we need wow. to work to improve this, to change this because we cannot give this chance to our patient because he is being treated by the health public system. We need to improve this. And maybe the most challenging is to give education to mm -hmm. make these people trained to early diagnosis, because what we have seen is that in this uh, north region, northeast region, and also Rio de Janeiro, which had a bad performance looking for the COVID-19, these people came to the ICUs and really advanced the state of critically ill disease. 50% with acute kidney injury already, and 50% needing invasive mechanical ventilation. So first, we need to improve the quality of care independently of the type of system that this patient is being uh, treated. The other point is to ensure that we are giving ability for these people, for the health professionals of the ICU, of the emergency, of the primary care, because the primary care is looking for these patients. They are doing uh, this screening of who needs ICU, who needs a referral center. So we uh, miss it, a Brazilian, a national protocol of care. In Sao Paulo, when we look to the University of Sao Paulo, well, which worked with a reference center of 900 beds, we worked with a protocol of care with very well established um, criteria of regular wards, criteria of ICU, criteria of ICU discharge and admission, we use the steroids in all the cases needing oxygen. We use heparin in all the patients uh, in a prophylactic way, in therapeutic ones, when we found the thrombos or when we have higher levels of diedema. In other words, we work with protocols of care where independently of the personalized medicine that we will always find in favor, uh, we need to have what cannot be seen during this patient's treatment? We had tomography, we have a laboratory uh, available. So we must try to ensure this for all the population. These are the main challenges in my point of view. It's interesting that the challenge is the same. Answers were perhaps different in different countries in, of Latin America, but the, change, the challenges were very similar. 
Now, we were just talking about social media. Dr. Sosa made a point about yeah, and social media. So technology is also a very an important issue when we're discussing pandemic as well. So now I'd like to discuss a little bit about telemedicine. Who estimates that approximately 60% of countries have expanded telemedicine during the pandemic? How has telemedicine uh, been leveraged in your country to support patients with suspect or even with diagnosed COVID-19? What aspects of your strategy would you advise other countries to adopt? Or how might other countries in your region conduct, in our region, conduct telemedicine differently to avoid any challenges that uh, you have faced? Unfortunately, telemedicine has not been correctly implemented in our country. As we were not resolved of this type of situation, we are not ready for this type of situation. People could contact with the medical workers through the internet and also by phone. But many people that suspect to be infected have not followed recommendation for taking the test. In other case, people that have contact the, the assistance service were only advised to, to drink uh, plenty of water and take paracetamol without even confirming or, or trying to confirm to a COVID diagnosis. In there was to appropriate follow up uh, and for this patient. So this question of our country cannot provide any advice on this regard to other countries because we need to, to improve our service. That's something that uh, caught my attention. I was talking to colleagues from other countries in Latin America, and when I talked to colleagues in the Europe and the, uh, colleagues from the US, everybody has a different approach to telemedicine. Ours in Latin America is very heterogeneous, like you said, when many people are using very particular ways of uh, addressing that issue. The World Health Organization, as you said, uh, released a paper on June uh, told him, uh, telling us that the uh, high-income countries, they were using telemedicine in almost 60% of the cases, and on the other hand, low-income countries using in about 40-43%. Uh, independently of these lower numbers of using telemedicine, we are using we have good programs in Brazil at the University of Sao Paulo. We have telemedicine for the state of Sao Paulo for ICU here uh, during 24 hours a day available with uh, physicians, physiotherapists and nurses. And also we make rounds in the ICU around the country to look of the priorities, to look uh, of the how they are managing the ventilated patients, patients who have um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and now we have protocolized care. Uh, and on the other hand, we can use the telemedicine to inform patients, to try to assess uh, those patients who need to go to the hospital, and at the same time, um, giving these patients orientation. So now we are using telemedicine in Brazil for the healthcare professionals professionals we are using also for patients and also to help to guide institutions so we are using telemedicine we are increasing the numbers of uh, access now only the university of sao paulo we have 20 icus of the state of sao paulo that we bounce daily but i'm sure that we need to improve the num these numbers to increase the numbers, and it will help also the access of um, people that now they don't have access to the physicians, they don't have access to the nurses, so we can give with more property a part of the treatment, of the treatment, of a diagnosis strategy, so we think that we should focus on telemedicine as an important tool to, to guide people, patients, and uh, healthcare professionals. This is great. And from the answers, it was clear to me that COVID-19 is affecting many different aspects of 
your lives. But let's move on now to economic. Another very important point when we're discussing COVID-19. Because there is significant debate about how to sustain normal activity during COVID-19 without compromising public health, given the potential consequences to economy, education, and even other realms. Based on your observation, what's the most balanced approach and what should be our top priority in Latin America? I would say that the most balanced approach will be one where social distance and distancing measures are encouraged, where people can be allowed to work from home whenever possible. Also, in some place, different work time frames have been implemented to uh, avoid large crowds in workplace. Face masks should be worn all the time. Uh, our top priority should be the development of a vaccine that can be safely and effective and most importantly, to be ready available for the entire population. We know that this disease brought lots of consequences in all the levels. However, we are living one of the worst challenges or the biggest challenges of this century. And I think that the only way um, to win this, uh, this challenge is really to work with science and education. Now we should look for this as the top priority of the country. And of course, with science and education, we will live earlier, we will live stronger, and we can rethink in our nation as a moment that we can think about transforming our country and the next generation. I don't think that we should leave the health and leave the education and focus in economy. Economy is a consequence of health and education. It is, like I said before, it is a major challenge in Latin America, to the world, actually, to Latin America particularly. But what about public health measures uh, that have been taken in our country to prevent the spread, spread of COVID-19 complications arising mm -hmm. from COVID-19 and comorbidities? And that's particularly interesting for us as cardiologists. And finally, what to strengthen the healthcare system to retain resources from COVID-19 cases requiring hospitalization? Our country has opened for a problem in quarantine, the, implemented, the implementation of a group field, the closure in school and universities, telemedicine, and for people to work from home until the end of the year. They are also trying to increase the offer of a Bible bags for patients that need hospitalization. They mm -hmm. have ventilators, they have improvised hospital to try to meet with the high demand. The demand on cardiology service was very, very, is very big. It's even bigger than we previously anticipated in the beginning of the pandemic. For countries such as Brazil, a continental country with more than 200 million people, this disease is even more challenging because we really have to allocate resources in many, many cities for more than 200 million people. And also, we should take care of the acute phases of disease, of the chronic complications, and of the other chronic disease which in the last decade in Brazil are now the main um, uh, diseases affecting mortality and quality of care. Now we have uh, to use this moment to really change our way of thinking disease, looking for prevention, looking for a better interaction between university, between the private system, and also including the health public system all of us, we should think together, we should think across barriers because our focus is the patient and now we should use this time to uh, promote a really a transformation in how we focus disease. We should focus prevention, we should focus promoting of health and not only leading with the crisis. I think we have um, 
learned a lot with this crisis and we will live stronger, but with a plan, promoting health, preventing disease and looking to the patient independently of the level of healthcare. I couldn't agree more. Uh, disease has changed everything and uh, we have a chance to be better, but it will depend a lot on the choices as well. Ludmila, thank you very much. This has been a very informative conversation for me and hopefully for you as well. A big thank you to our panelists and viewers for taking the time to join us. I hope you will tune in for our next discussion coming soon, where we will go into much greater detail on the major disruption of standard NCT services caused by coronavirus, their consequences, and mitigating strategies we can follow as healthcare providers. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I have enjoyed this, this debate and hope to see you next time. I'm very honored to participate with this in this meeting. Thank you, all the organizers, and thank you for having invited me. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.